All right, so we'll introduce our next speaker. I think most of you know uh, this person, Milan Javle. Uh, he has really dedicated his academic career to the uh, treatment uh, of cholangiocarcinoma and really trying to make headway in improving the treatments for this uh, very difficult disease. Uh, he's a, um, a medical oncologist at MD Anderson, and he's also the fearless, one of our fearless leaders of the International Cholangiocarcinoma Research Network, uh, which is really a, a, a fantastic group of individuals, global, as we know this is a global problem, but worldwide coming together to uh, in, in increase research and improve the management. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Javale to give you all an update on what the ICRN is doing. Thank you very much, Shishir, for your very kind introduction. Uh, I think the, I, of all the meetings that we all go through, too many, uh, this is really my favorite one because not only can you attend the academic uh, talks and the research, but you actually can get to ha share a, a meal with, your, with patients and their families, and, and it's, um, it's a real learning experience for me. So uh, unlike the other talks that you heard this morning, this is a more basic one, how can we increase research in this disease, not just here in the US, but internationally. So a few years ago, this was uh, really Mitesh's idea, uh, he proposed that we start an international cholangiocarcinoma research network to incentivize research in this field, incentivize trials, bring pharma to the table, and this is uh, uh, the result of three years of work. Uh, so, our goal, so in the next few slides, I'll discuss what our goals are, why is international collaboration necessary? Uh, I'll briefly introduce the executive committee and working groups. These are volunteers who spend a lot of time uh, discuss biorepository. I'll, I'll request Lewis, uh, uh, a very well-known scientist from Mayo Clinic here, who will discuss some of his work. Clinical trials, the role of advocacy. Mitesh will talk about FDA initiative and Asia-Pacific meetings. So. Um, our goal is really to eliminate the burden of cholangiocarcinoma worldwide. And we, have, we want to achieve it by, with two simple goals. Uh, collaborative clinical research. For too long, we have functioned in silos, in MD Anderson and Mayo and Emory, et cetera. We need to work together. Uh, we have collaborative clinical research and increase uh, access for trials uh, globally. Uh, we want to establish tissue and uh, data uh, repositories so that this, this type of uh, information on this, at the science level can be done more efficiently. And uh, why should it be international? I, I, this slide was uh, given to me by my friend, uh, Bertel Landmark, and it explains why really collaboration with, uh, uh, is necessary. So if you look at some of these diseases, so biliary cancer is up there, uh, 8,000 in the United States, as you compare that with Asia, which is 220,000. So the tumor types that we regard as orphan tumors here in the US, uh, these are not orphan tumors rest of the world. These are life-threatening diseases uh, in, in occurring in parts of the world where patients have limited access. So uh, you can actually uh, conduct studies and uh, do research in a, in a global forum, and that data can be leveraged for, uh, for us here uh, to get drugs approved and trials done in a more efficient way. Um, so this is what we hope to do in, in, through, in, through our network. So over the last three years, we established a network uh, within, within the US and, 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 and we have now 18 centers who have joined us. Uh, and in addition, we have 11 centers. And I, uh, thanks to the work by, done by Reham, um, who is a, a coordinator, uh, a work, working with us in MD, PhD really, and she has, uh, there's now almost 11 international centers, including 10 in Asia. Uh, this is our, uh, the, the working group, uh, uh, Mitesh, uh, myself, and Stacy. Uh, we do the nuts and bolts work, but we are uh, very privileged to work with this team here of surgeons, uh, uh, international collaborators from UK, from Thailand, um, and we have established uh, leaders in these various working groups. Uh, this work would not have been possible without uh, Donna Mayer, Riha Mali, the, in the, um, uh, Kathy Wagner, really a great amount of work in terms of industry advocate, uh, and advocacy with Melinda. So, so far we have these initiatives. One is to establish a database. And uh, database, we, we really don't know what is the incidence of cancer, what are the genetic variations that lead to cancer in different populations. And Lewis uh, here is the world expert on, on that type of research. 
Uh, we have an industry forum to really bring industry to the table so that they can be incentivized to, um, uh, to initiate trials in this disease. Uh, clinical trials, uh, the infrastructure is monumental and really beyond the capacity of our group. So we have collaborated with various research, research networks, such as the CREW and PRECOG, and then we want to do this at a global level. So uh, I'm going to ask Lewis uh, to tell us why it is important to do a genome-wide association study. What does a genome-wide association study really mean? And how do you, uh, how, what have you been doing in the last five years that has impacted patient care? Thanks very much, Melinda. And um, I'd like to again thank the Stacy and the Calandra Casanova Foundation for their support of this work. Um, I, this um, genome-wide association study is really one of the components of the biorepository effort that we've had for a number of years, and every year I come up and encourage more centers to join, and as, as you'll see, that actually has been a very successful effort. And our goal really has been to be able to have the tissues, blood specimens, and other types of specimens necessary to move the science in this field forward. And so um, at many centers, when patients have surgery, the, um, the physicians and researchers are storing tissue, so they get permission from patients to store their tissue. They get permission for pay from patients to obtain blood samples. Some of those blood samples go into programs to try to improve the detection of cancer. We've talked about the difficulties with detection of biliary tract cancer. There's multiple efforts underway to try to improve detection. Now, the genome-wide association study is one of these efforts, and its goal really is to understand whether there are variations in everyone's inherited genetic material that lead to an increase in the risk of cholangiocarcinoma. So many of us have heard, have heard already about the BRCA genes and their role in breast cancer, for example, and the fact that people who have an inherited uh, mutation in this gene, BRCA, are at higher risk of developing breast cancer. Um, part of this effort is to see if we can identify similar genes that, are, that confer or locations or variations in the genome that confer risk for biliary tract cancers and cholangiocarcinoma. The challenge here is that we have to look at many places in the genome. So our genome is about three billion bases, so three billion individual nucleotides that make up everyone's genome. And of course, at each, at each nucleotide, you, you can have a variation. You can have up to four different nucleotides um, in, your, in your genome. So you can imagine that there's lots of different combinations of everyone's individual genome. And so what these genome-wide studies do is they try to assess the regions in the genome that we've found to be most variable, where most people have some variation, and see if we can identify variants that seem to associate more closely with a particular disease, in this case, cholangiocarcinoma. To do this, you need lots of samples. And so what we set out a few years ago was to, we started out with a goal of collecting 1,000 samples from patients with cholangiocarcinoma to compare to um, 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 people without cholangiocarcinoma. This effort has actually been extremely successful. Um, we now have approximately 2,800 samples from patients with cholangiocarcinoma, another about 500 um, samples from patients with gallbladder cancer. We we're able to convince uh, the National Cancer Institute to do the genotyping for this initial, what we call discovery phase effort. And um, we actually just got the last set of samples in, shipped to NCI this week. So we hope that by the end of the spring, we'll have at least initial results from this um, set of 3,000 samples. Now, it took us about 20 years to collect the 3,000 samples at all the different medical centers. So our second specific aim, what I call here the validation phase or replication phase, we would like it to happen faster than, than, than 20 years. And so what we're doing here is we're recruiting a group. We currently have a group of about, I think it's 34, um, centers are in, in, in North America and Europe particularly. There's also a separate effort in Thailand by the National Cancer Institute that we hope to merge with this effort. And what we are hoping to do is get funding from the National Cancer Institute 
to collect samples more broadly and hopefully be able to complete the 3,000 sample collection in about three years so we can do the replication phase. So hopefully that gives somewhat of a background for um, what we are trying to do. These are the current participating sites. You can see with the stretch from Alaska to uh, Northern Europe, sorry, not from Alaska, from, from actually Australia to Northern Europe, um, lots of different centers participating. And I wanted to thank um, particularly the patients as well as the investigators in the different centers that are contributing. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Lewis. So you, you might, you know, if you fast forward to the future, uh, you can think of a time when we can do a blood test and have a risk profile of various cancers uh, and what our individual risk profile is, for instance, for cholangiocarcinoma. So the work that he's doing will have investment way in the future, but, but it, it is going to have a great impact on how we uh, screen and detect this disease early. Uh, an important initiative for us at ICRN is collaboration with industry. Uh, and this has been really successful because the industry partners have met us halfway. They ask us questions often in terms of who does the science, who does, who has the mouse models, and uh, we have Dr. Bardisi here who, who helps the group uh, uh, in that effort. And then Kathy Wagner, who is a, a, a coordinator for this industry link, uh, she has probably affiliations with over a thousand companies now to bring them to the table. Um, we have them present their information in an in industry forum, such as the one we have today, and then several of those uh, end up being clinical trials. Uh, we have got now into the space where we are actually running our own trials. We have realized that they're that trials that we need to direct as patients and caregivers and they may, uh, the pharma have certainly been very uh, uh, helpful to us, but uh, our priorities may be different. So we have to um, uh, have these trials performed in an efficient way uh, through multi-center collaborations, and we have been able to do this uh, for at least three such instances where investigators come, came to us with a concept, uh, we got pharma on the table, um, we got input from advocacy, which is again something new. Uh, patients and advocates in the past had very little to say about what trial is important and how this should be conducted. No concept actually goes forward without them signing off on, on, on the validity. And then we also want to uh, invest uh, our energies into the next cadre of investigators. So these trials are all led by junior investigators who will hopefully uh, devote their careers to cholangiocarcinoma. Uh, this is uh, Melinda, who, who we'll hear about later. Uh, she has played, uh, played a really a key role in, uh, in helping us as far as what trial would be useful for patients and what trial, uh, what should be the possible conduct of this trial. So I'm going to briefly run through three such trials. One is a surgical trial run by Dr. Rocha and Shishir Mathail. You just heard Shishir earlier. Both are really rising stars in surgical oncology. And they took a signal from a trial that was run by my colleague, Dr. Shroff, a chemotherapy trial where uh, out of 60 patients, 10 patients who were not operable eventually got, became operable. So now they want to ask the question, can we take this trial to borderline situations, patients whose tumors are are large but not metastatic, can we then downstage them and make these tumors resectable? So uh, they are investigating this trial in a, 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 for intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, a subset of the cholangiocarcinoma population. And uh, this trial is, uh, is, has gone through a lot of vetting process. Um, uh, uh, Celgene, the, the pharmaceutical companies, is doing their best they can to help us in the process. The second trial, as you've heard through this meeting, about FGFR inhibitors and IDH inhibitors. These inhibitors are now uh, uh, are in the forefront of investigation for patients who have had two or three lines of therapy. Can these be used in the first line setting for patients who have not had any prior treatment? Can they be combined with chemotherapy? So Dr. Jonathan Weissand, from, right from here, from University of Utah, is asking this question in a first-line trial where he combines one of these two agents, either an IDH inhibitor or an FGFR inhibitor to gemcitabine and cisplatin chemotherapy, to ask the question, A, is this trial feasible? And B, what is the outcome? Can, will this add anything to just chemo alone? Uh, this is the uh, schematic of this trial where patients start on chemo. As you know, molecular profiling and genetics takes a few weeks. So at the time of the first restaging, like two months when the scan is back, 
one of these agents will be added uh, depending on the molecular profile. Now, uh, the third area that our group has been interested in is this subgroup of patients who have DNA repair gene mutations. We feel this is the next, the third big basket of genetic abnormalities. And a drug, this drug, Olaparib, is approved for BRCA pancreas cancer and uh, in, in, in some preliminary studies may have efficacy in cholangiocarcinoma. So we are investigating this study. The study is uh, led by another junior investigator, Daniel Ahn, from uh, Mayo Clinic. And he will look for a genetic profile that identifies DNA repair defects. These defects occur in about 20% of patients with cholangiocarcinoma. And these patients, after chemotherapy, will basically be, be, be given this pill, uh, Olaparib. Uh, uh, time is running out, and I'm going to ask Mitesh to quickly turn on uh, uh, to discuss the uh, Asia meetings as well as the FDA initiative. Thank you, Melinda. Uh, also, big thanks to uh, Stacy and the Kalenja Carcinoma Foundation for putting this together. And of course, uh, I also echo Dr. Javli's comments about this being a very unique meeting with uh, the level of patient engagement. Uh, we uh, feel your sense of urgency and. Uh, uh, keeps us motivated to uh, do what's needed. So uh, as uh, Dr. Javli mentioned, uh, uh, while we're focusing some efforts here in the U.S., this is really a global disease, and the uh, uh, largest burden of disease is actually in Asia. Uh, so from that perspective, uh, last year we, uh, with our Thai collaborators, were able to uh, launch the first Asia-Pacific uh, uh, Kalanja Carcinoma Conference. I think we were quite ambitious at the time and already called it the first annual uh, Asia Pacific Kalanja Carcinoma Conference. Uh, so I'm delighted to say that we will uh, uh, be hosting uh, the second uh, iteration of this uh, in late March of this year. Uh, during um, a visit to Thailand last year, uh, we were able to visit uh, Northeastern Thailand, uh, Khan Ken University where uh, there's probably the only cholangiocarcinoma ward in, in the world. Uh, it just gives us a sense of uh, uh, the burden of disease in, in that region that they would need a whole dedicated ward to care for their patients. And you can see that the medical team there is just as dedicated and, and uh, eager to do whatever is necessary as here. Uh, this is the second Asia-Pacific conference, uh, as I said. Uh, for those of you uh, who can come to Thailand, we welcome you. Uh, this, besides uh, being a region of high incidence, it's uh, probably one of the world's most uh, traveled destinations, and uh, our, our hosts have been very, very gracious. Um, surrounding this uh, meeting, there are several other um, visits from the ICRN. Uh, other countries in Asia, as uh, Dr. Javli mentioned, are also heavily inflicted with this disease. So uh, along these lines, several meetings are planned in Korea, uh, in northwestern Thailand, in Chiang Mai, uh, with Stacy, uh, Dr. Goyal, and others. And uh, following the Bangkok meeting, um, a visit to the country with the highest um, total incidence probably in the world, uh, China, with uh, our colleagues from Shanghai. So uh, again, as I mentioned, uh, the purpose of this is because of the very high disease burden, uh, where it's not necessarily such a rare disease uh, anymore in, in, on top of being a, a lethal disease, and where certain other factors come into play besides the fluke and um, uh, other factors you heard today. Also, hepatitis B uh, contributes very significantly, particularly in China. Okay. I'll finally speak on an initiative which is probably very important to all of you in the room. As you know, there are no FDA-approved drugs for cholangiocarcinoma. Uh, all the drugs being used are, had been generic, so there were no regulatory filings, um, and very important trials were done uh, using these drugs uh, by, by our colleagues from uh, UK and, and elsewhere. Uh, so with the large pipeline of drugs that look promising, how can we um, work with our colleagues from regulatory agencies to see if they can get into the hands of doctors everywhere um, and, and, and not face the 
restrictions that trials may impose. Uh, from this perspective, uh, we have been able to engage uh, somewhat with our colleagues in the U.S. Uh, Dr. Hariba is in the audience somewhere right there. Yes. So in Dr. Hariba and our colleagues, we found a very sympathetic audience to uh, our concerns. Um, uh, a workshop was organized last year uh, with uh, representation from FDA, uh, patient advocacy with Stacy and others, and uh, a number of uh, folks from academia. And a few um, initiatives were identified, um, and, and these broadly comprise uh, trying to define endpoints in trials. Do we necessarily need to always do large randomized trials? Are there other faster ways? Um, how can various regulatory agencies work with each other? Um, and what can we do to reduce the burden on patients for getting into trials? Do they need to repeat tests just to get onto a trial, or are there sort of more um, streamlined ways in which we can be patient-friendly given uh, the less common nature of the disease and the urgency with which we, with, uh, which we need to work. Okay, so I'll stop there and turn it back to Dr. Jabba. Thank you very much. There are many challenges here which are listed here, but that's why we need all of you to engage with us. Uh, and I, we have emails here, we have some initiatives uh, listed. So please be in touch and, and see how we, um, we could work together. Uh, making ICR in a strong organization. So thank you very much uh, for this opportunity to, to review our work.